Okay, hi everyone. We're just gonna wait maybe 30 seconds to a minute to see if other people are still trickling in and then I'll introduce Khadija and then we can start. All right, I think we're good to go. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping rules. So the talk will be around 20 minutes. You will get 10 minutes afterwards for questions. If you have any questions, please just type them in the chat or the Q&A button as they come along. Um, and without further ado, I'd like to introduce Khadija, my fellow countryman, who will be talking about her experience of Huntington's disease in Pakistan. Okay, so thank you so much, Mustafa, and thank you so much, HDYO, for inviting me here today. So as you can see, um, I have written, the first thing I have written on my slide is, I see you. And when I say this, what I'm trying to say is that I see you, I can feel your pain, and I understand what everyone is going through. So the topic today, which I'm going to talk on, is my experience of, you know, growing up in a family um, with Huntington, uh, Korea, uh, but in Pakistan. So um, for everyone to know that uh, my mother's story and, and where I've written Abu, we, all of us, like three um, children, we call our mother Abu. So this is for just for reference, you guys don't get confused. Uh, my relationship uh, with Huntington, Korea is that my mother had HD, my maternal uncle had HD, my maternal grandfather had HD. Uh, though I never met my uh, maternal grandfather, uh, my mother and my uncle, both of them passed uh, like four and a half years back. Uh, both of them uh, like suffered around 18 to 20 years uh, with this disease. And I'll talk about more on how this relationship has advanced over the years uh, in my slides. Uh, when and how I came to know about HD. So when I say when I came to know about HD is something which is going to be very uh, maybe different from the rest of you because um, in Pakistan, nobody sat down and told us that, you know, your mother is not well, she has a Huntington chorea, and this is a genetic disorder, and you or your siblings might have this one day. So we had a very different kind of, you know, introduction to Huntington chorea, where we used to listen that, you know, my mother is not well, my uncle is not well, he had to retire from army, come back because, you know, he's not well. We just heard they are not well and just pray that, you know, they get fine and I remember from childhood just praying for their health, not knowing what they have, what I can have, what my siblings, my first cousin can have. So nobody sat with us, nobody told this to us. And one by one, we started taking different responsibilities because, you know, she was not well, she couldn't take care of the house, of the family and everything. Um, so we just took everyone, uh, my sister, my brother and I, we took different kinds of responsibilities and made sure that, you know, we are the responsible ones and we'll be, we'll be able to handle all of this. Uh, very soon, um, there was a role reversal kind of thing where it came a time when I became a primary take care, you know, who was taking care of my mother, rather than my mother taking care of me. And when I say this, I'm pretty sure a lot of you have been through the same thing where they had to take care of their loved one, a parent perhaps, and where, you know, they felt like they were the ones who are their guardians or they are the ones who are taking care of them rather than they taking care of us. Same thing happened with me. There was a role reversal. And, you know, when I look back, I just see that it happened really fast. I was very, I was very young. I was, you know, just a child. I was in my teen, year, teen year years when I had a lot of responsibilities. Talking about the facilities in Pakistan, and when I say poor facilities in Pakistan, let me uh, tell you that it's not that I'm complaining that, you know, the, uh, about the healthcare system or something. We do not have anything for Huntington Korea in Pakistan. 
We do not have the testing facility. We do not have any uh, you know, insurances. We do not have the government taking care of us. Uh, nobody knows about Huntington Polia. There are no centers where you can you know, keep your loved ones or you can have call nurses, train nurses or anything. So this is how bad the situation is. Nobody knows what Huntington Polia is. Uh, to this extent that I think uh, my mother's in-laws, like my father's uh, side, has had no idea that the mother was suffering through Huntington Korea. While they were very close to our family, they used to come and meet us. When my mother was in the hospital, they used to come and pay a visit. But still, they don't know. My cousins still don't know that, you know, what my mother had was Huntington Korea. Nobody knows. Uh, and when you research in Pakistan, you won't be able to find anything on Huntington Korea. So the doctors don't know anything. Uh, the nurses don't know anything. People don't know anything. They're not empathetic to what is happening. So there are very poor facilities in Pakistan. <clears throat> so talking about my mother's suffering and, you know, I all, whenever I tell someone that, you know, my mother had Huntington Korea, they don't know. And when I try to explain them, it's very difficult to explain them, them when I say, you know, yeah, uh, she started with mood swings and then it got into, a, you know, no, a, 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 a involuntary movements and then you know she got bedridden the, yes this is what she has and when you google it these are the things when you you know go over them these are the things the definition you will find but Huntington Korea is more than that we all know this we all have been on that side we have seen the suffering this is not just a movement disorder or this is not your brain losing its control over the body it's way more than that and we have seen it progress it is a you know progressive disease and every step is very very difficult um, in the start, uh, my mother just, you know, had jerky movements. I still remember the first time, you know, her cheek used to just go like this, twitch, a little twitch on her cheek. It started off with this and later she was bedridden after 18 years. There's one time when, which stuck to my mind is, um, there was a time when uh, I was in my A-levels, uh, you know, even say high school. Um, and I remember I was sleeping and her room was right next to me. And I heard like a glass has crashed and it felt like that somebody has thrown a glass trolley from first floor to the basement. There was such so big noise and I just st uh, woke up and I just ran outside and I never once thought that it was coming from her room. I just ran to the opposite side towards the staircase and I saw nobody there. And I, then suddenly I ran into her room. She was not in, on her bed. And I was like, oh my God, I think she, uh, she stood up and she went to the bathroom. This was a time when, you know, she was in denial that she needed help. She was having these movements. She, she, she was uh, falling very often, used to get stitches and something. And I, when I just opened the door, she was on the, floor, on the bathroom floor. And the, we, have that, we had that shower cabinet, a glass shower cabinet. She fell on it and that shower cabinet broke and she fell on it and there was blood everywhere. I just ran out and I started shouting and I, you know, remember knocking my brother's door without even realizing that he's not at home. I just like waited, I don't know how long, just, you know, and then I just opened it, opened the door when he was not here. I went back, I saw her and I, and I, and I went like, you know, I need to take you to the hospital. And can you give me your hand? And I still remember when she gave my hand, I could see her, you know, veins and everything. It was such bad uh, cut. And I remember just picking her up with help of one of our uh, house help, uh, female house help, which we had. I brought her out. And at that time, I just had a scarf lying next to us. And I just picked it up and put it on her hand. So it uh, stops the flood flow. I don't know how I did that. I was in high school. I have no idea that this was the right thing to do, but I did that. I took her to the hospital. I called my father. He was not, uh, he was not at home. I called my brother. I called my sister. They rushed to the hospital. She got 56 stitches, st stitches all over her body. She went through two surgeries and the recovering period and everything. And I think that is the time when that is, a, that is something which never goes out of uh, my mind. Uh, this is something which has been with me for the longest. Um, and as I said that I was in my A-levels and I was uh, taking a few days off taking care of her and everything. At that time, I changed school for my A-levels. And uh, you know, you can see the, uh, the word undue advantage. So the supervisor there, uh, 
um, called me in and said, you know, Khatija, you have not been coming to the classes. Um, I think you're banking classes. And I said, you know, ma'am, I'm not banking classes. My mother is not well. Um, she has Huntington Korea. And I think that was the first time I opened up to someone um, other than my friends, of course, that, you know, she has Huntington Korea and I take care of her. And, uh, you know, this thing happened and she was hospitalized and everything. And now, you know, I have to take care of her. Uh, that is why I'm missing school. And uh, she said that, you know, I need to talk to your father. I said, sure. My father had a meeting with her and I thought that everything would be fine. Then two weeks after that, she called me uh, again to her office and said that, you know, you can't come to classes this late. Uh, you need to come to school at eight. I then again told her that, you know, I have to feed my mother, take care of her, make sure I have changed her and everything. And she said, Khadija, it seems like you're taking an undue advantage of your mother's illness. And I was like, man, you don't even know what this disease is. You don't even know what you're trying to say. Like, you know, undue advantage of my mother's illness. I'm in my A-levels and you don't know what I have been through. And that was the time when I stopped talking to my instructors, to anyone else that, you know, this disease is in my house, is, is in my uh, family. Because I knew that um, there is no point of sharing this with anyone. Um, I think one of the biggest challenge, which was while my mother suffering was dealing with depression. As I said, uh, Pakistan has very poor facilities also talking about depression. I think still in Pakistan, it is a taboo. Uh, people do not talk about depression, which they should. And, uh, you know, I find it very, I find it very um, alarming that we don't talk about depression. Um, she had, you know, she, uh, she was going through depressions. So we thought that this is uh, part of her disease. We had no idea. We were reading articles, everything, trying to know what is this. And we just thought this is part of her disease and this cannot be, you know, fixed. Uh, there is no medicine for this as well. And this cannot be fixed. Uh, there were times when she used to cry so loud that uh, for days that we had, eventually we had to sedate her through injections. There were days when we had to sedate her through injections. There were days when she used to lie on the floor and keep on crying, you know, and the crying was not just sobbing, it was crying on top of her voice, because obviously she was in depression. There were times when her neighbors used to come when they were, you know, they, they, they had so many concerns, not that to complain, of course not neighbor, but you know, that if everything is okay. And I remember there was a day she was crying, 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 and you know, she fell and she just fell on the Floor and she didn't know knew what to do and she was just crying. She was lying down there and she was crying and I didn't know what to do and I thought I just need to go there and lie down next to her and I just went there and on the floor I would just lie there and I just started looking on the wall. I thought this is the maximum I can do to help her because you know what what am I what else can I do and I and I'm talking about my uh, high school life here when these were things were happening. Then we got to know that, you know, we can differ antidepressants and we started giving those. And I believe that that was something, a uh, game changer for us because uh, after that, she, uh, her depression was in control and everything. And that was something uh, which really helped us. Uh, we had to, eventually we had to hire full-time help for her. But then again, I'm telling, I'm talking about a time when they, they are, nurses are not, um, you know, uh, they don't know anything. They are not. Uh, prepared. So we had to train those nurses ourselves. Uh, we had to pay them, we had to train them. And there were days when um, somebody, well, when, you know, I was in my university and uh, I used to get a call from my father, you know, that today uh, Abu's nurse didn't came because it was X, Y, Z reason. Can you please come back home? Uh, change her because she didn't get up in like half an hour or so. I used to come back after taking the class. I used to change her, give her food and everything. And I used to drive back to my university. And then again, I was not opening up to my instructors because of that incident which happened with me. Um, and to the cost where my CGPA and everything was at stake, I had no idea what I was doing. I couldn't obviously balance between uh, taking care of her and my university CGPA and all of these things. So this was like uh, even hiring full help was something where we had to you know, train them and everything. Uh, there was a time when I went to Turkey for Turkey month. And I came, uh, when I was there, it was her birthday. And I remember I called from there, my friends were there, you know, the, all of the, like my class fellows and friends went to Turkey for Turkey month. And when we, we were representing our school there and I just got a call from my 
home and I, it was her birthday and I felt so bad that, you know, uh, it was her birthday and I started crying there that I missed her birthday. This was, this is how much, you know, I loved her and I still love her, of course. Um, when I came back, I got to know that my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, who was, who was an awesome um, lady. She was the one who, because of who all of us are so strong and all of us survived this. Uh, she was there, she had to stay, um, like she was always here, but um, you know, at that time when I was in Turkey, she had to be available more. So I don't know what it was that, uh, that one day my mother was in depression or something. Uh, she had an argument with her and she said, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to jump off these stairs. And my grandmother was trying to, you know, push her and not let her do this. And in this, and she was, my mother was saying that, you know, no, no, I'll just jump off the stairs. I'll just jump off the stairs. I just, I'll do this. And it was a very difficult situation for my grandmother. When I came back, I got to know this. And uh, that was the time when I realized that this was the realization that all of us, uh, fit in as a jigsaw puzzle. We are a unit, the people who take care of my mother, my uncle, and we rely on each other. Uh, we support each other, we rely on each other, and one, you know, this is a jigsaw puzzle. One puzzle cannot be missing. To, so I decided that day that, you know, I have to be available for my family, and that was the day when I decided I could not go abroad for my bachelor's, my master's, or anything, that all of us have these responsibilities. So, this was another time, uh, you know, there was a self-realization of, you know, this is my responsibility and I have to take care of her. Uh, Peg tube was something which was, um, I believe, the most difficult time for all of us when she, uh, when we had to give her peg tube, we didn't have the awareness or anything about there. I still remember the day I lost her, it was four and a half years back. I, there have been days when I, Still, I, there have been days that I still remember her and I can't even imagine that she went away so fast, like so early, whenever, I, if for someone else, um, if they say, you know, they talk about paradise or we say Jannat or a good place, you know, after our life, they, they would describe it in different ways. For me, if I say my mother is paradise, is in paradise, I mean, she, she's working on her own. She needs nobody's help. Uh, she is having the best food without choking her meals. This is the paradise I'm imagining her to be in. And I'm hoping it's not less than this. Yeah, these are some pictures of her. We used to get these customized cakes made for her birthday on Mother's Day. This is her, you know, when she was young. This is my mother. This is my maternal uncle, my brother. And she always used to have this smile on her face. Um, yes, I try my best to have that smile because she always had the smile on her face. Uh, my experience of testing. So two and a half years back, I decided to get my test done. The reason behind was that uh, a, um, I always knew that, my brother and I always knew that, you know, marriage is something which we, if it's on the table, we just need to know that uh, if we have tested positive, the other person needs to know, and we do not want to have kids after that. So that was the idea. And also, uh, my brother was showing some symptoms, and I knew that if, uh, you know, if only he gets tested, and if he, uh, if his result comes positive, and everyone will start planning future in a way that where I will be taking care of him, and that's fine with me, but I need to know that I myself am not positive. So I knew for you know, planning the future of take, think, taking responsibilities on, I need to know if I'll test positive or not. And uh, we got the test done from Singapore. Uh, there was this doctor in Pakistan who arranged this for us. And by the way, now there is no facilities in Pakistan, so nobody can get tested. Um, the uncertainty uh, of the time uh, in between, like there were four months, uh, and it was, the uncertainty was killing us. Um, I think this was a difficult, that was the most difficult time for me. There was a time when I remember I had no idea what to do and I just went out on a drive. This is what sometimes I do. And I was on a traffic signal and a beggar came to me and he was asking for money and he was, you know, giving me that, if you give me money, 
uh, may uh, you get a good proposal, may you have good uh, kids, and may you have a very good life and all of that. And I think he said that may you have a healthy life uh, or, maybe, or maybe something related to health. And I just looked at him and I just gave him 50 rupees. Uh, and I don't know what was on my face that he saw and he just gave that back to me and said that you are worried about something and I really hope that goes away. And I'm not going to take this money from you. You just keep this money with you. And once you know your wishes are fulfilled, you could find me and give me money. And that day I realized that a beggar on the road could see how desperately I wanted to test negative for this disease. Um, and meanwhile, I uh, got, uh, my cousin rescued a puppy and then she realized she cannot take care of him. So she brought it to my house. He was two years old. I took care of him, took care of him for two months till he was able to eat and feed, uh, like walk and everything. He was a stray puppy. Uh, I used to feed him uh, with, uh, you know, dripper and everything. And I used to wake up after two hours and I was so indulged with him that the time passed. And I was so, I'm so glad that I was able to take care of him at that time. Um, on the result day, uh, we got to know that, um, you know, the, re the result day was something very, very, how to describe the result day. I, I still don't know how to, I remember that um, because my brother and I both tested, uh, like got our test done together. Uh, we got a call from Dr. Sakib that you need to go to this uh, counselor and he will hand over you the results and we went there. And uh, since I'm saying that we knew that my brother was showing symptoms, so we knew that we were anticipating a positive test, a positive result from him, and, but uh, we didn't know anything about, it. we were not anticipating anything from you, of course. So two of my very close friends, my sister, my brother, four of us went to the counselor. And when we went there, he said, there is one good news and one bad news. And I just, you know, like for a minute, I just burst into tears and then a happiness because everyone there under thought that what he's trying to say is that my brother has tested positive and I have tested negative. And he said, what did you understand from this? And we said that one of us has tested what is positive and one has tested negative because good news and bad news. So he said, no, no, this is not what I'm trying to say. And what I'm trying to say is that, you know, you, here are your results. Go and see, go outside in the lobby, go sit there and uh, go over these results. And you rest of you, like my two friends, uh, my uh, sister, he made them sit in his room while we both of us, my brother and I were sitting in the lobby going through our results that what has happened. And I don't know, this was his way of breaking the news to us. And as I always thought, my lucky number is 22, because of course it is my birthday, but uh, that day my lucky number came 46. My cadre tweets are 46. I tested positive two and a half years back with my brother. Um, yes. Um, so at that time, it was a very, we were devastated. Um, at that time we were fine because you know, at that moment, I knew that if I break, everything will fall apart. My brother has also tested positive. I have also tested positive and it's a very long journey to go. We just, got, we just got started, you know, just the first step right now. So this is where we, all of us were very devastated. Um, and you know, the post result, my life. So there was a time when I used to feel this heartache um, the next morning when I woke up, my friends were, uh, were there and they woke up and I said that I'm feeling this heartache in my heart. Would, it, would this ever go away? And I just pray this, this goes away. So I was uh, going through a job process meanwhile and they called me in like three days after I tested positive and I was like, I can't do this job and I'm going to leave this job. And my friends and my family members said, you know, just go there for a day if you like it. Uh, just continue with it. If you don't, you let them know that this has happened and I can't do this. And because this was a job I was first went. Well, I went there, I really liked my job. And from that day till now, I have been working. Uh, I have been achieving all my goals professionally and I'm very happy and satisfied where I am right now. Um, after that, it was very difficult to share my results with my father and the point that I wouldn't be able to take care of him. You know, the responsibilities which fall on me, I won't be able to do that is going to be something very, very uh, devastating for me. But I think after that, I have become more at peace. I know the results and I'm, and like you can say, I have made peace with those results. 
Uh, there is one thing I'm practicing right now, sec uh, writing secret letters for my family and friends. So I'm writing these letters for my family and friends when I'm not there and when I can't give my piece of advice to them, I want them to go over those letters and uh, they, they'll get, definitely get those uh, when I'm not around. So things I have learned from Huntington, empathy, uh, living in present, being resilient, being strong. I think uh, this disease has made me very strong, resilient, uh, living in present, because I know that as all of us have suffered so much, uh, we have lost so much to HD, and I know one day it will take away my brother, and I also know one day it will take away my sanity, and the one thing I like the most about myself is my mind. It will take away that as well. But I know for the fact that it could not take away my present. So the present I'm living is mine, and I promise that I will live it. And I try my best, and I wake up every morning and I try to live the day to the fullest. My support system is my family, my friends, my colleagues, uh, and HDYO. There was a time when in my A-levels, I wrote to HDYO for the first time, and I got a reply in two days, and they were so empathetic and so helpful. And since then, I think I have bugged Matty so much. I just know that, and he has been so helpful. Uh, and I'm so thankful that I got this opportunity to speak here, and I'm so, so glad that he created this uh, HD bio group for everyone. My goal, my current goal, other than, of course, like my personal goals, this is to set up an association in Pakistan. Um, we are already working on it. Um, we now have doctors who are on panel. We are working on a website, because when I say all of these things, and when I'm talking about my suffering, I just want to say that I, luckily belong to the privileged part of Pakistan where money is not a problem. There are so many people who do not, cannot afford the treatment or the care of anything we were able to have for, uh, for my mother or will be able to have for myself or my brother. So this is something I, this is my goal and I am just hoping after this talk, I'm able to you know, connect with different people and set up an association in Pakistan. Thank you and apologies. So firstly, apologies for those people, uh, especially those uh, for if, if I've not been able to do justice to their experiences. Uh, I got a chance to represent Pakistan. I'm sorry if I was not able to do that. And apologies if I have triggered anyone uh, while I was sharing my experience. And thank you so, so much for inviting me here and being the lovely audience. All right, thank you Khadija for the extremely brave sharing of your experiences. Uh, with that, are there any questions for Khadija? There's a lot of positive comments for you Khadija. People are showing yeah, their support. I would love to go through these. Yeah, I think if you stop sharing your screen, you can go open the chat yes. up again. Yeah, perfect. Great. Yeah. So yeah, lots of people letting you know that you're definitely not alone. Definitely. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much, guys. Are there any questions for Khadija? We still have a couple of minutes that we can use to ask her anything. All right. I don't think there are any questions. Thanks again, Khadija, for the extremely powerful story. And I'm glad Pakistan is now being represented for sure. I think we need to set up an association and I'm glad you're working on that as well. Thank you so much, Mr. Oh, Pam. There, Thank you. there is one question though. How is the puppy? <laughs> uh, how is the puppy? Thank you. So I had to give it back to my cousin who rescued it uh, and gave it to me to foster. And when he was two months old, we had to, uh, I gave it to my cousin, but he's fine. He's good. Um, nice. Cool. Yeah, there's a lot more positive comments coming in. Um, with that, I think we're good. Oh, so there's another one. Uh, what do you think are the biggest challenges specifically to establishing the kind of infrastructure in Pakistan for people with HD? I think we can go uh, on and on about this, but I'll let you take the floor. Thank you so much, Rasna. Uh, so I think the biggest challenge is the mindset of the people. A, the people who are suffering uh, through this are not ready to accept, uh, for instance, my brother is one of the people who has not shared this, uh, his results with anyone. I think I'm the alien one now who is talking about this on such forum. 
so people's mindset is something which we need to target that this is not uh, this is a disease and we need to get, uh, take tackle this as a disease uh, also uh, the then it becomes a lack of awareness so since doctors don't know about it so we need to start off with uh, making sure that people own their story start telling them and are not ashamed of the challenges they have faced and the disease they have and of course uh, making sure that we have doctors and everyone who is aware uh, and know what hunting in korea is yeah exactly i think the biggest challenge for pakistan as well is the lack of knowledge because i remember from my experiences coming from an hd family as well i think the way my family approached it was they thought that if my aunt got it my mom wouldn't they had basically no knowledge of what hd was in general anyway uh there's one more question um uh also oh, that's just wondering how we can how people can help set up the genetic testing infrastructure but we're already working on that i think uh, with dr sakib uh, the counselor or the geneticist khadija mentioned so something hopefully in the next year or so should be available for testing i think the biggest challenge hopefully. for that is again the lack of awareness people doctors don't even know what hd is sometimes so it can be difficult to diagnose it's mostly diagnosed as parkinsons i think i don't know what your experience is on this arkhija but you can feel free to comment no no i think you, i totally agree with you that uh, people do not know about it and that is why they think that it's parkinsons or any other disease so they don't know about huntington and i think hopefully we'll be able to set up an association and work our way through that you know and introduce uh, genetic counseling as well as genetic testing for the people in pakistan exactly yeah and that's one of your end so that's great all right yes. i think we're a bit over time thank you so much again khadija for coming on and sharing your beautiful story your thank story you. of thank perseverance you. um yeah so i think now we have a 15 minute break and after that we have a couple of talks i think track 1 is um a panel on mental health and experiences in hd and on track 2 we have emma lawson Emily Lawson who's uh, sharing her experience of juvenile onset hunting disease. And with that I think I'd like to end the session sending you lots of virtual love Khadija and giving you strength in your thank you struggle, and good luck with your job and thank you everyone for attending. Thank you so much. All right. Take care everyone.